guys for coming. Uh, this is Builder Dark Scale WordPress site. Uh, I'm Greg, and this is Alan. Uh, we both work for Boston.com. Uh, recently, we migrated Boston.com to WordPress, and we'll show you a little bit about how it went. Source control? 
audience. No? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we use the version uh, that's really important to source control. Just wanted to get that out there in case anybody wasn't. Um, GitHub is also great. We are looking more into using GitHub as an organization. Um, some of our code examples will be on GitHub later. Um, we have a lot of really great automation um, that helps us out. Um, first and foremost, we use Composer to do our uh, plugin dependency management. So all of our WordPress plugins, both third party and some of our ones that we've written ourselves, are in Composer. Uh, so the first thing we do after we check something on some version is run Composer install. And um, that automatically installs all the plugins to the theme. Um, we use Grunt for a ton of stuff. Um, you might have also heard of Gulp. Uh, so it does our JS bundling, it compiles our SAS into CSS, uh, provisions our virtual environment, which is on Vagrant. So basically, all of our local environments, we just run Composer install and then runs, and it just creates a custom virtual machine that has the same kind of setup as our production machine. Uh, and we're up and running it less than 10 minutes, hopefully five. Uh, so it's a big help to being able to like, work really efficiently. Um, and we also do continuous integration with Jenkins. Um, also, Travis is an open source alternative to Jenkins. So what Jenkins does is it kicks off all these jobs uh, depending on certain actions. So for example, we'll be doing a subversion commit and we tag a Jira ticket, which is our project management tool. It will update the ticket with the subversion information. It will mark things uh, for code review and generate a pull request. When the pull request is accepted, it will move it along. We also deploy every, almost every day um, to our QA servers and to production. And it just does everything basically automatically and allows us to build pretty much every day and release continuously. That's a huge help. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about some of our coding standards. Um, we use WordPress VIP's coding standards. WordPress VIP, if you didn't know, is uh, just a WordPress hosting service. To be on it, you have to follow certain parameters uh, about input sanitization, security, uh, some style stuff. Um, we use Sublime as a text editor, and you can see some of the, if you're curious about some of our linkers and stuff, they're going to here. Check them out later. Um, the GIF here is DocBlogger. Uh, it's really good for making comments, uh, commenting your functions. As you guys probably know, documentation is super, super important, especially when working with a large team. That's often something I forget to do. Um, definitely take the time to do that. And as I mentioned before, we do code reviews. Um, so we use Fabricator to do pull requests. Um, you might have seen pull requests like on GitHub as well. So if I code with a feature or something, I'll have somebody like Ellen look at it, make sure it meets our standards, and uh, it's architected in a way that makes sense. It like, won't do anything crazy. Um, and it's really important to have a second set of files on anything you're doing because it can really save you from a lot of trouble down the road. So another really important thing to, when you're working with a big team is organizing your code, just organizing your files. Uh, and this, you know, somebody could work on a feature and then be out of sick the next week and somebody else has to go fix a bug and they have to be able to find where that code is and everything. So. Um, that was really important in setting up our, our file structure. So what we have is we have a source folder, and all the stuff in that source folder gets compiled by Grunt into the VDC plugin that you'd expect to see in your WP content themes folder. Um, so we break up our fonts and images, scripts, sprites, styles, and our templates. So everything is really well organized. In templates, one of the biggest thing I wanted to mention was that um, a lot of times in WordPress themes, functions.php can get super out of control, especially a site as custom as this when you're doing tons and tons of stuff. Every stack workflow you read is going to be like, oh yeah, just throw this in functions.php. So everybody throws tons and tons of stuff in functions. Um, that can get really out of hand really fast, really super long. So what we recommend is just making a folder. Our ink folder is where we keep all of the functions that are included in functions.php, and they're all each separated out to their own their own PHP files. So we might have like assets.php where we include all of the queuing of our JS and CSS. And then we might have admin.php where we do any of the manipulations of our admin. So it's all super organized, super well commented, separated out into separate files. Then in functions.php, it's just a list of requires or includes for those, for those files. So that way there's no actual functions in functions.php. Um, and this is just really nice. It keeps everything organized. If you have to delete some functionality or add some, you can just delete that file. 
Um, another thing worth mentioning, we have a partials folder in templates. And so what that is, is all of those sort of base, the only files in the base of our templates folder are those base templates that you expect to see there, you know, header.php, index.php, et cetera. Um, so all the stuff in there is, is basically a set of includes as well. And then the actual meat of the, you know, the markup and everything is in partials, also separated out into separate files based on what the module is or whatever. So for example, we might have like some social buttons and we need those social buttons on both our section fronts and our footer or something. So that way we can easily include that partial wherever we need it. Um, so definitely split stuff up, keeps, keeps stuff organized, it's really useful. Oh, and then our styles folder also follows the same format. So if you go through partials and then into a folder and into a file, if you wanna find the styles associated with that template, you can just go into styles and follow the exact same file folder tree to get to the right styles file. So that's super nice. That's, those are SAS partials. Um, another thing with this is that um, you can even split up ink further. So if you have like custom fields, for example, we have a fields folder and inside of that we have each group of fields or type of fields in a separate file. Then in our function set PHP, we can just loop through that folder and include all the files in there. So that is nice it's, instead of having to include a giant list of a bunch of stuff. That's just another, another tip. Cool. Uh, I'm sure some of you guys are curious about uh, how our servers are set up. Uh, we don't personally do Ops stuff, but we have a wonderful Ops team. And this diagram is actually made by our director of architecture. Um, so if you're curious about how we manage to do this with physical machines or virtual machines, um, I'll just go over it for a second. Uh, so if you're a site user and you come to our site, the thing that you can get is the Fastly CDN uh, that caches all of our static content. Uh, basically, anytime an article is updated, um, it purges the cache, and it's just your basic CDN. Um, behind that, we have the running the middle firewall. Uh, it does basic security stuff, filters out potential DDoS attacks, injection attacks, um, all that business. And we have load balancers. Um, and the load balancers control our Apache web server, our SQL cluster, and our Elasticsearch cluster. Um, they're responsible for making sure each node is in sync with the cluster, uh, takes them offline if they're not. And the nice thing about our load balancers is they keep a persistent connection to Apache. Um, and the really expensive thing about using Apache is that opening and closing connections can take a lot of resources. Uh, so by maintaining those persistent uh, we're able to kind of negate the downside of using Apache and benefit from all the uh, upsides of Apache. Uh, we use MariaDB as our, uh, it's just a MySQL cluster. Um, but the really interesting thing here is that we have an Elasticsearch cluster. Um, Elasticsearch is a full text search index, um, it's a search engine. So it's really great for searching metadata taxonomy, which is normally a little bit of an expensive task in WordPress. Um, you can even search against metadata that isn't a table scan, meaning you don't have to look through every row that matches a query. Uh, instead, you just search it at anything as an indexed field. Uh, so basically, I'll talk a little bit about that in a second, but it intercepts SQL queries and just serves our uh, database information through Elasticsearch. Cool, so now we're all set up. Uh, we're gonna go over some code examples, really simple code examples, and I'll talk about in this for a bit. <laughs> yeah, uh, so once you sort of have your workflow set up and all that, you're gonna save yourself a lot of time. Um, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about plugins. So WordPress, plugins are one of the best things about WordPress. There's so many out there. Anybody who doesn't feel comfortable going into code can just pick a bunch and set up the functionality they want. Um, and this works out great on most WordPress sites. However, at a, at a WordPress site of the scale of boss.com, um, there become problems. When you have a tiny bug in a, in a plugin that is not a problem at all on most sites, it gets you know multiplied when it's on a site like boss.com. When we have you know two million visitors a day, and 20 people in the admin at any time, we have to be really, really careful about this. Uh, so we came up with this list the help of our ops team. Um, and this is a real basic list. I mean, you could definitely change and add to this. Uh, but it's super good for just helping you vet plugins. Um, so this is not only useful for us choosing which plugins are good and bad for our site, but also for talking to the product and 
business side of things because a lot of times with WordPress, everybody has experience, has some experience in WordPress and has, has used a plugin for some functionality. And we were really worried about having people come to us and say, what do you mean this functionality is going to take this long? I've you know, used this plugin on my own website and it does exactly what, it, what I'm asking for, so why can't we just use that? So we really needed a way to sort of come back at them and say, well, it doesn't do this, it does this, it doesn't do this. Here's the requirements that we are setting. Um, so some things that we look for, obviously, does it work with the current version of Core? You know, when was it updated? What's its rate? What's it rated? That sort of thing. Um, we also look for, you know, how many authors it has. When was its previous release? How old is it? This kind of stuff is important because if there's like one author, what if that person goes and gets a job and then they don't have time to support the plugin anymore and it gets out of date? And we really rely on these plugins for really, you know, basic parts of our site. So if they were to go out of date, um, we could lose big chunks of our site and have huge problems. So we also look for if it extends the database, writes to the file system, um, you know, executes raw SQL, those things are all security risks. So those are really important. Um, so anytime we're running a plugin, we run through this list, see how it does, and then decide to take it or not. Oh, we also look for if they're approved for VIP, because generally good plugins tend to be approved for WordPress VIP, and then if we ever wanted to go to VIP, we would be able to, because we'd be only using VIP approved plugins. There have been some that we find to use that have been, but we try to. Right. So we want to give you guys a few examples of good plugins gone bad. Um, how many of you have used Yoast before? A lot? Yeah, it's a really great plugin. Um, it does a lot of really useful things. Uh, SEO is obviously really important to us. But we came across this little bug that just left a lot of orphaned options in our database. And when you have as many posts as we have and as much content as we have, that really added up. Uh, so basically, you can see in this graph, uh, about three months ago, and over the course of those three months, uh, things just tick up and up and up until things like peak at 885 megabits per second of throughput, and then dip a little bit of again, and then they like drastically jump up again. And that huge drop is when we like finally caught into what was going on and just purged all the extra meta from our database. Um, so now we're now we're looking to move away from Yoast. Um, I definitely still recommend Yoast for smaller websites, but um, definitely vet your plugins and make sure that they are working as intended. Um, there's some other performance gadgets we ran into. Um, I mentioned, uh, yeah, I love that uh, I mentioned we use Elasticsearch. Uh, so, yeah, that's a little chat. Um, so we use, we use a WordPress plugin called Elastic Press, which basically intercepts our uh, SQL queries, as I mentioned before, and routes them to our Elastic Search cluster. Uh, this has been really vital for us to be just up and running in the first place. Uh, the night we launched, we were pushing 50,000 queries per second, and because we had Elastic Search in place, uh, it was really PHP that had a hard time keeping up. Our database would have completely fallen over uh, if it weren't for that. I would definitely keep that in mind to have some kind of plan about indexing queries, using Elasticsearch, or an indexing engine, um, it's super vital for running large website. Uh, another weird thing we ran into were PHP memory limits. Ours is 128 megabytes right now, uh, which is pretty large. Most shared hosting uh, things have smaller memory limits. Um, and basically what was happening was we had a ton of home page revisions. Uh, in three months, we accumulated about 6,000. Uh, and we had plugins that were querying the number, the full amount of home page revisions every single time. And basically it was running up against that memory limit, just causing things to pop. So our, our home page screen uh, for the admin, which editors need to get into all the time, uh, was loading in at around like 40, 50 seconds. Uh, and after we figured that out, we capped the number of revisions at 200, and the home page loading time on the admin side, just dropped right back down to normal. Definitely watch out for that if you have content that like gets updated constantly. What's next? Uh, I did not mention transients. Thank you. Um, so another problem we had were uh, Facebook Instant Articles plugin, uh, which is a very good plugin. It was leaving behind a lot of database transients, which are temporary uh, database records. And that was also called plugin for database. Uh, similar to the OS thing, just watch out for things that leave artifacts behind. Okay, another plugin that we 
kind of started out trying to use and then realized was not viable at this level was advanced custom fields. So I'm sure probably a ton of you have used advanced custom fields too. I've used it on freelance sites, it's awesome. Um, however, it had all kinds of little things going on. It had like three or four distinct selects per field. It had some broken logic determining its own path. Um, it had trouble exporting and importing into its fields, and that was a big issue for us with migration, because we needed to be able to write scripts to migrate into new fields. Um, so that was just kind of summed up as generally fragile by our ops team, and we could not use it. So what we ended up, uh, luckily we were working with Ally Interactive, and they were like, hey, we've written this awesome plugin, um, Field Manager. So Field Manager, you can just find on GitHub, and it's it's great because it's way more simply written, doesn't do any of that stuff I just talked about, and most importantly, it moves the managing of the, the fields out of the admin and into the code. And this is really important for a website of our level because we have you know 40 different users of all different roles, and we don't want anybody being able to go into the admin and accidentally deleting huge swaths of our site, right? So uh, moving it into the code, only the developers have access to that. So that was really important. So. Um, we wanted to show you a quick, that's just the documentation, but you can just Google field manager and I'm sure you'll find it, but it's really simple. It has all the same kinds of fields as, as advanced custom fields does, it handles repeater fields. So we wanted to show you a quick example of just setting up a field using field manager so you can see how easy it is. Yeah, so um, as you might know, it's really important to provide like custom fields for people to uh, kind of separate content from presentation so your authors are not writing markup all the time. Um, a lot of plugins, will just add a few meta fields on your edit screens. Uh, and you can save a lot of performance just by doing it yourself with a field manager. Uh, so it's really this simple. Uh, this is one of our fields. Uh, you basically just instantiate the field manager class. Uh, there are tons of classes for selects, images, groups of things, um, everything under the sun that you would want. You give it a name, a description, and then you just pass it in your attributes. This one's really simple. It's just uh, required and has a size on it. Um, and then the class has a method called add meta box, where you just give it the metabox title, you tell it what post it goes, goes on. So T's is one of our custom post types. And then uh, normal and high are just WordPress placement keywords. Uh, I think one of them, actually, after title is one that's available in Build Manager um, that isn't normally available in WordPress. Um, and then you just add an action, um, and you're done. So it's really simple, and here's what it looks like. Uh, so here's a few of ours. Um, it's nothing, we just wanted to show you, you know, plugins to be like a scary thing to write if you're new at this, and it really can take as little as five minutes, and will save you a lot of hassle in the future. Um, as I mentioned before, it's like really important for uh, you to be able to separate code from content from presentation. Uh, custom fields are a really important part of that. Um, so, for example, embedded videos are the number one most requested feature by editorial. Um, anytime Tom Brady does something weird on TV, on a talk show or something, our journalists want to be able to post it in an article and talk about it. Um, so, wherever it happens, we need to cover it, whether that's on CBS Local, Ellen 2 YouTube, anywhere else. Some of these sites are supported already by WordPress, but for the ones we not, that aren't, we have to write a custom embed code. This is because before, in our old CMS, uh, editors would just throw embed code markup um, straight into posts. And this is a huge nightmare, uh, both for migration and security reasons. Uh, we didn't know basically what they were posting. Uh, they were posting inline JavaScript, iframes, who knows where. Um, we had years and years of content. APIs have changed since then. Um, you know, we're, it just opens us up to all kinds of vulnerabilities. Um, so you really want to stay safe by creating easy ways for authors to include and format content. Now we're going to show you a couple. Um, the simplest example is a shortcode. A lot of people use Shortcake or another plugin to manage this on the admin side. But it's really, really easy if you haven't done it before to just do it with your code. Um, all you do is add a shortcode using the WordPress function. You just give it a name. Uh, these are pull quotes. Uh, and then it passes you basically the content. And you just do some simple string transformation. We're just throwing a P tag around it with a special class that will style it. And that's like the really simplest uh, shortcode example imaginable. Uh, to build on that a little bit, this is a little more complicated, but like not too crazy. And this is one of our video embeds. Um, so this is actually a video. It's Storify, which 
which is a website that aggregates social media posts, and it's really nice, kind of like boring. Um, so the first thing you do is you create a regular expression uh, with the URL. Uh, this one's actually really simple. It's just storify.com slash the ID. Other, other sites we use have like way more complex schemes and such a thing than but. Um, like shortcodes, we register an embed handler uh, matches that regular expression. And I will say, just as a word of caution, um, it gets a little bit expensive to do these regular expression matching over the content. Because basically every time, if you have 30 embeds, every time you have a post, WordPress is searching all the regular expressions over the content every single time. It's not such a big deal when you have the default WordPress ones or just like five extra ones. But when you start to get 30 or 40 of them, you know, 100 of them, and you have hundreds of thousands of posts, it gets to be a little bit expensive. And we're kind of grappling with that right now, um, balancing our needs with product's needs. Anyway, go back to the code. We also add a short code if uh, journalists prefer to use that. And then the embed handler is similar to the short code example. It's just doing some basic string manipulation. It's just stripping out the protocol. Uh, it's figuring out what the URL of the inline JavaScript that we have to add, and figuring out the embed URL of the iframe that we have to include. And that's it. It just returns the string and puts it straight into the content. Editors can preview it just like uh, normal O embeds, like YouTube and Twitter and stuff. It's already supported by WordPress. Super easy. All right. So some other stuff that we ran into um, that was pretty important for a big site like ours with this many users. Uh, the first one is that editors really needed the ability to sort of have drafts after a post is already published. We have like editors and writers, and they go back and forth with um, you know revisions and changes. So. For a while, they were like printing out articles and like writing on the printout and then putting that. It was kind of crazy. So um, we needed a fast solution to allow them to sort of, after a post is published, edit, look at, save, you know, and then republish. So we ended up using a combination of the plugin Clone and Replace and Field Manager revisions, and that gave them the ability to sort of clone and replace posts and keep track of those revisions. And neither of these are perfect. The combination isn't like perfect. We didn't have a ton of time to do a custom rollout for this, so this is working for us in the meantime. Uh, another really important thing called custom roles and permissions. You know, we have 40 users for our site, so we don't want people who are admins accidentally logging in wrong and going somewhere else, or you know, we don't want anybody having access to what they shouldn't have, basically, and that's really important. So um, <coughs> we've set up very custom roles and permissions. Uh, we use the members plugin. We only use that on our development environment. We just sort of use it to, to see visually all the roles because there's so many and they're all named so similarly and they aren't named necessarily in accordance with exactly what they do. So it can be a little confusing. So that plugin's really nice for just kind of seeing it visually. So we save those. Uh, we end up saving those options as JSON on development and then we just load those options on our, on our production. Um, environment, so we don't actually use that plugin on production, but it's it's been useful. Uh, we also had the need for having multiple authors on a post, as well as guest authors, so people who don't actually have a WordPress account, but were an author of a post. Um, so Co-Authors Plus has been super awesome as far as that stuff goes. It allows us to have multiple authors, guest authors, everything. Um, however, it's definitely a really hefty plugin because it's doing a ton of work. So uh, we've had issues before with it sort of slowing down our admin, but then a newer version worked perfectly fine. So it's just watch out for it, but it's um, it's really it's a good one. Another thing I kind of just wanted to mention, because this has been a big part of our lives recently, is that the future of publishing is is coming quickly upon us. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with all these sort of mobile news aggregators that have been coming out recently. There's Facebook Instant Articles, Google Amp, Apple News, and we've sort of been needing to mold our WordPress templates into all of these formats um, so that we can stay a prominent news source. Um, so the tough part about this is they're all competing, so each of these requires a template that's a completely different style. So Apple News is all JSON, Google AMP has like their own HTML tags, like AMP image and AMP ad and all kinds of stuff. Uh, Facebook Instant Articles doesn't even let you put any styles in, you have to do all the styles to the Facebook admin, so they're all just very different. Um, and this has been a big challenge because 
now we have four versions of our article, basically. And anytime there's a design update, we'll, we're going to need to update all of these versions. And these all are built for speed, so they're very restrictive. For example, Google AMP, you can only have up to 50K of CSS, and it's all in line. You can't use any JavaScript, really. Um, so it's been challenging. But these plugins are sort of up and coming. Um, the Instant Articles one we mentioned gave us a ton of database transients, so we can't actually use it yet. Uh, but we're hoping that pretty soon that will be resolved and we'll be able to go forward with it. Um, Automatic and Ally Interactive made the, the AMP and Apple News plugins we've been using, and those have been working out pretty well. Again, these are all really in development because this is all super new. Um, but they're on the right path. To The nice thing, they kind of just take like the WordPress content and spit it out for you in the right format. We had a lot of customizations to deal with, but yeah. We're doing those. Cool. Uh, so I'm sure many of you are wondering, was it worth it? Um, we spent a few workouts, and we got some feedback from an editorial about how it went. Um, so the news is really good, actually. Um, <laughs> yeah. Thumbs up generally. Uh, they say yeah, this is from Dan, our moments of living editor. Uh, he says in general, our workflow is better, faster, and stronger. This frees us up to be more creative and write better pieces that are more visually appealing to readers. Uh, so we asked him a little bit more about what that meant, and uh, one of the biggest things is that editors and journalists can now file from outside the office, from phones or any other mobile device. Uh, before there was like a Windows-only desktop client that they had to file through, and it was not good. Um, being able to preview posts the WordPress way has really improved editorial's ability to format information. Uh, they can also schedule posts for future publication dates, which is really nice and easy WordPress, as you guys know. And being able, just small things, like being able to get the URL before the post goes live, allows them to schedule social media uh, posts. Their publish times are way faster. Uh, they're telling us that they were saving hours, not minutes, which allows them to publish more and better articles. It also said it makes work more fun, which makes it work better. Uh, so that would be really uh, heartwarming to hear. Um, all right, so we want to share with you a few of the resources that we talked about. Uh, just a dump of all the various links of uh, things we talked about. Uh, I put up a bunch of event code examples on GitHub. You can check it out um, at github.com slash um, WordPress VIP has some great documentation on best practices and their coding standards if you'd like to use those. Talked a lot about Field Manager, Elasticsearch, Elasticpress, definitely check them out. And now it is question time. Uh, if you'd like to sidle up to the microphone and ask us a question, we're open for business. Thank you. We're also both going to tweet out those slides for all, so if you want those slides, grab them here. Do you also have a mic? Or just ask. If you ask from there, we'll just repeat it. Okay, just do it. How are you dealing with the uh, integration of the website with the big publication? Is it only from one central database? How yeah. So he asked how do we integrate the, uh, the website with the print publication. Um, that is actually something we don't have to worry about, luckily, because the Boston Globe is a separate website. And they're still on Method, and Method, uh, our old CMS, is built specifically to do that. It's actually primarily a way to lay out the newspaper, and then it's a web CMS on top of that. So. Yeah. So with the phone, they can write in one place and it gets sent to both website and newspaper. Yeah. Yes. I have another question. Is, sure. How do you do it with detailing? Is it going to detail making sure that this, the content is available or shows up on the uh, native app? Yep. Yeah. So uh, we have, we're indexed pretty heavy. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, he asked how we deal with uh, deep linking, making sure that everything is kind of available to search engines and apps. Uh, so, as a pretty big website, we're indexed pretty heavily already, uh, but we did have some issues that we resolved using sitemaps. Initially, we were going to use Ghost for sitemaps, and that didn't work out. So, um, we also have a very comprehensive archive. Uh, posts that didn't quite make it over through migration uh, automatically get redirected to an archive. Uh, so if WordPress does a 404, we have a handler that checks a few different places for the article and makes sure that like all of our SEO links are up and running to the best of our ability. Anyone have anything? Yeah, I have. Right, a question over there. Can you give an approximate budget for how high of it is? And are you going to get a little bit of detail about how you replace Yoast? 
so he asked um, what the approximate budget would be for a project like this and what we had to do to replace Yo's L. I'll take this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about the budget. Uh, I actually have no idea because I'm just the yeah. lowly developer. Yeah. Well, we, did, we do have, well, as I mentioned before, we have 10 full time developers uh, and we worked for about a year on this. Yeah. And we're still working on it every day. Any of them have any? We use, yeah. yeah, in the beginning we, we had them on retainer. Um, we have a few hours left, but really it was primarily for the beginning of the project. Yeah, that was super useful in the beginning, and then we kind of found that eventually we just knew enough to be able to make those decisions ourselves. Um, yeah, it, it takes a long time. And when we were initially planning it, actually one of the best things about having, having Ally Interactive was having them come in and say, oh no, you're not going to be done until like November. And we've been saying that forever, but until you pay someone to say it, <laughs> nobody believes it. Um, uh, but yeah, it, it was definitely a big project. It could have been, and getting advice is a really good idea, because there's definitely mistakes we made that we would have saved time had we not. So, uh, what was the second half? It was about replacing the host. Uh, uh, we're actually doing that this sprint. Um, it, took, it took a few few days of investigation to take stock of everything we were and weren't using it for and get the right sign off. And then we're currently in the process of getting rid of it. And it should be done within, our sprints are about two weeks, and it should be done next week. Yeah, what, as far as what we're doing, we're just kind of like creating the OG and meta tags and everything ourselves, just pulling from the fields that, that we want to pull from. We're adding a field if we need one for edit to curate that. Um, we weren't using those for anything like too, too complex. Yeah, at least that was like kind of not our focus before launch. So, um, yeah, if you have any more like detailed questions about that, you can grab us after. Question in the back. Um, since I'm on the end, I'll be good. Um, it's on. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, great talk. Thank you. And my question is, you mentioned trying to keep the um, authors from inserting into their posts yep. and using short codes for that. Does that mean that you disable the text um, tab when they're editing? Or it's just an honor code? <laughs> we actually did disable the text tab. And this was really <laughs> controversial because <laughs> the developers were like, yeah, we don't want them putting anything in there. And you know, they but they do need it to format sometimes because sometimes stuff gets a little wonky in the visual editor. Um, so that has been an ongoing conversation. I think we have we enabled it again yet. Right now, editors. So there are editors and they're just authors. Um, so editors can override it and go to the text app, but authors have technically not have permission. Yeah, so we have like a few people who, who edit the writer's work. So the writers don't have text app access right now, and the editors do. So if there's some emergency with formatting, the editor can go in there and do that. So the short code, you have a short code button in the WYSIWYG part. Yeah. Yep, yeah, yeah, we add buttons to the tiny MC. Yeah. For the video embeds, it's as simple as copy and pasting the link so they don't even have to go to yeah. the editor. That's what that red dark thing is for. So it works like on the web. Yeah. But you can just put the URL in the content and it will find it for you. That's what the, what the, people, the, the custom video embed example that we showed? Yeah, that's, that's yeah. what that does. So we have two minutes and I saw a question here and a question there. Why don't we do this first and then that one? Uh, so the question was, are we running PHP 7 yet, and how hard was it uh, with all the migrations? If so, uh, I can say really quickly, we're on 5.6. We're on, for some of our smaller micro sites, we're up to 6. Yeah. That, that's also hard. Yeah. So we'll get back to you. <laughs> yeah. All right, question in the back. Uh, thank you for sharing. If uh, You mentioned a few times having issues with database transients. I'm wondering if you're using or had considered using a persistent object path. So the question, yeah, the question to repeat it is uh, with all of our problems with database transients, um, if we're going to use persistent object paths. Um, I actually cannot answer that question. Um, that is something that our ops team uh, handles mostly. Um, but yeah, that, that is a great suggestion. Thank you. Um, all right, we have one minute if there is another question. Yes. Uh, how do you handle like a 
you know, a new release of WordPress or a plugin update, what's your process for evaluating? Uh, what's our process for when plugin, plugins or WordPress are updated? Yeah. Um, we have a composer.lock file that locks us into all our plugin versions, so none of those are updating without us knowing. Um, WordPress actually updates automatically in our build process, so if there is an update, it just kind of gets shot out there, which is a little scary, and we definitely um, are probably going to work on that process a little more, but usually we notice it and we're like, okay, WordPress updated, we run regression tests and, and look at everything and make sure that everything's still okay. Um, with plugin updates, we try and do it as often as they come out, but we're really careful about it. Just when we update, we just you know run a full QA regression to make sure that nothing is broken about that feature or about the whole site. Um, so that's like a process we're improving for sure, but it's just, for now, it's mostly just being careful. All right, guys, uh, thanks a lot for paying attention to that whole presentation. Uh,